Good morning. I'd like to invite you all to close your eyes and imagine with me for a minute. Imagine yourselves at some point in the future. You're just settling down to dinner and you're watching TV when a special news bulletin comes on. We take you now to the White House for an announcement by the President of the United States. Ladies and gentlemen of the world, I have a historic announcement. Today, using data taken from the Sagan Space Telescope, NASA scientists have confirmed that the fifth planet orbiting the nearby star Tau Ceti shows evidence in its atmosphere for molecules indicative of biological activity. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to tell you today that for the first time, we found evidence for life on another planet. Sounds like the opening scene to a blockbuster Hollywood science fiction movie, doesn't it? You know the one in which a few scenes later, the technologically advanced civilization invades, but somehow we manage to overcome them through a combination of our ingenuity and, you know, aw shucks pluckiness. But what I'm here to convince you today is that that event is no longer in the sole purview of science fiction, but rather it is rooted firmly in science fact. And that future may not be so far away. But let's put that aside for now. As a professional astronomer, I spend a lot of time on airplanes, and occasionally the person next to me will try to strike up a conversation. And they usually start by asking me what I do for a living. And so if I'm grumpy, I'll tell them I'm a physicist, and the conversation usually ends there. <laughs> but if I do feel like talking, I'll tell them I'm an astronomer. And then invariably, at some point in the conversation, they all ask me the exact same question. You all know what that question is. Are we alone? Is there life out there? We are fascinated by that question. We desperately want meaning. We want to know why. Why are we here? And somehow, if we could find evidence that life arose on another planet, that we're not alone in this universe, it might provide some sort of context to our humanity. For me, it started in the second grade. I grew up in a rural town of less than 5,000 people in South Central Illinois called Staunton. Uh, Staunton is a former coal mining town in rural Macoupin County, and there football reigned supreme. And as a gay, nerdy kid, more interested in books than sports, I was somewhat of an outcast. Fortunately, I had several amazing teachers, and one day one of them did something that changed my life. On that day, my second grade teacher, Mrs. Eleanor Gregory, gave us an assignment. Go home, memorize the name of the nine planets, that's back when there were nine, in order, right, and come back with that memorization. So I went home and I pulled this book off of my parents' bookshelf. Our universe is a picture atlas of astronomy, and in it are the usual things. Newton in the apple, how Saturn would float if you had a big enough bathtub. But what really fascinated me was a chapter that speculated on the potential for life on other planets in the solar system. It described fantastic beings, blimp-like creatures floating in the atmosphere of Jupiter, beings that lived off of pure radiation skating on the surface of Europa, and hydrocarbon-burning stove bellies that live on Titan. Wow. Completely preposterous, of course, but endlessly fascinating. And that was it. My course was set. 33 years later, I'm a professional astronomer. And so when that person on the plane asks me, do I think there's life in the universe? I say, I don't know, but I'm trying to find out. And here's how I and others are trying to go about the scientific pursuit of answering the question about whether or not there's life in the universe. The way we do it is we break it down into smaller, more manageable pieces, and then we work our way up. So we start off by just asking, are there planets around other stars at all? And if so, do any of those planetary systems happen to look like our own solar system? And then do any of those solar systems happen to have Earth-like planets, rocky planets with thin atmospheres and the right conditions such that they can have liquid water on their surface and therefore potentially host life as we know it on the Earth? And then we study those planets in great detail to see if we can find evidence of biological activity, evidence of life. Answering even the first of these questions is incredibly hard. Planets are incredibly small. I realize this is hard to believe given that we're standing on the surface of a planet that is so vast that from our perspective, it looks flat. But to put it in perspective, say this marble was the size of the Earth, then that would be the size of the sun. 
Planets are incredibly small, and stars are incredibly far away. If that were the size of that sun, that planetary system I talked about at the very beginning, Tau Ceti, that would be located just beyond the distance of here to the moon. So 20 years ago, this was the one planetary system, just 20 years ago, this was the one planetary system we knew around a normal star. This is, of course, our own solar system, although I've done a little revisionist history here and removed Pluto. It wasn't until the late 80s uh, that we developed the technology to be able to find planets around other stars, specifically the CCD camera, much of like what you have in your cell phone. Right? And then not long after, in 1995, we found the first planet orbiting a normal star. That planet was found orbiting the star 51 Pegasi, an otherwise unremarkable star, the 51st brightest star in the constellation Pegasus, located about 50 light years from the Earth. And since for hundreds of years we only knew of one planetary system, our own, we naturally assumed that all planetary systems would look like our own. And so it came as quite as a shock when we found this planet, and it looked absolutely nothing like any of the planets in our solar system. It's a Jupiter-sized world, but rather than as we expected it to be, we, wanted, we expected it to be located in the outer regions of its planetary system, this planet has somehow managed to migrate to the hot environments near its parent star, much like retirees moving to Florida. <laughs> its orbit, in fact, is so short that its year lasts only four days. And in the intervening 50 years, astronomers have witnessed a revolution, sorry, in the intervening 20 years, astronomers have witnessed a revolution. We have detected over a thousand planets using a bewildering variety of methods, telescopes, and instruments. And with the discovery of each one of these strange new worlds, we've seen an expansion of our understanding of the diversity of planetary systems, and we've made enormous strides in answering that list of questions. The planetary companion to 51 Peg was discovered only a few months before I started graduate school. And in retrospect, the uh, timing couldn't have been any more perfect because I was able to participate in this effort to answer these questions from the very beginning. So I want to tell you a little bit about what I've, what I've done. So I'm a tenured professor, so we all know that that means I don't actually do any more work anymore. <laughs> so when I say what I've done, what I really mean is the things that my graduate students and my postdocs have done. So I want to tell you about the work of a fifth-year graduate student at OSU, Thomas Beatty. Thomas is looking for planets using a telescope called KELT, the kilodegree, extremely little telescope. <laughs> and as the name implies, it's not a very big telescope. In fact, it's not even a telescope at all. It's a high-end camera lens slapped to the back of a CCD, stuck on the back of a sturdy mount, and then dropped into the desert of southern Arizona. And KELT is a robotic telescope so every clear night, it wakes up, points at the sky, and takes images of hundreds of thousands of stars over and over and over again until sunrise. KELT is looking for planets using a technique called transits. So planetary systems are randomly aligned with respect to our line of sight. But occasionally, we get lucky, and one of them will be perfectly aligned such that it passes in front of its parent star once per orbit. And when that happens, it'll cast a shadow on its star, causing the star to dim ever so slightly. And so by taking thousands of images of hundreds of thousands of stars, we can look for these repeated dimmings that are the signatures of planets. And Kelt has found six planets so far in this way. And here's a picture of Tom standing in front of his car with a vanity license plate that has the name of one of the stars around which he found a planet. <laughs> Can you blame him? <laughs> I don't actually want to talk about that planet, however. I want to talk about the first planet Tom found, which has the very unsexy name KELT-1b. KELT-1b is a bizarre world. It has a mass of roughly 30 times the mass of Jupiter. In fact, it's so massive that we're not sure whether to call it a planet or a brown dwarf, a failed star. But even more extraordinary is KELT-1b's orbit. Uh, its orbit is so short that it only takes 29 hours to go around its parent star. In other words, its year is just slightly longer than our day. This planet is so massive and so close to its parent star that it has managed to spin up its star and reorient it such that they're locked in each other's gaze as they orbit one another. Now, this romantic situation is not going to last forever as the star is nearing the end of its life. And so in a few billion years, it will expand and swallow its planet whole, thus unceremoniously ending the honeymoon. 
So Thomas's work is addressing the first of these questions, do planets exist around other stars? And the discovery of KELT 1b and 51 peg demonstrate that the answer is emphatically yes. And whereas we originally imagined that other planets would look like our own solar system, the truth is much more spectacular. Mother Nature is far more imaginative than we are. So does that mean that solar systems like our own, with giant planets in the outskirts of their planetary systems, are rare? Well, answering that question has taken a little bit longer. And that's because the, planet, the methods that we originally developed to find planets, like the radial velocity method used to find 51 peg and the, tra and the transit method used to find KELT 1b, are not sensitive to those kinds of, of planets in the outskirts of their solar system. The, uh, finding those planets took the development of a technique called gravitational microlensing. Gravitational microlensing was, uh, was invented by, uh, uh, by Albert Einstein in 1936, although he famously predicted that it would never be observed in one of the few cases that he was wrong. In 1992, my former advisor, Andy Gould, proposed that you could use this method to find planets. And the basic way it works is as follows. Say you stare at a star long enough. Eventually, another star is going to pass very close to your line of sight to that more distant background star. When that happens, the gravity of the foreground star will act as a magnifying lens, causing that background star to get first brighter and then fainter. If that foreground star happens to have a planet, that planet can also act as a magnifying lens, albeit a slightly weaker one, and it'll cause an extra little bump on top of your light curve. And it's those little bumps that we use to find the existence of planets orbiting other stars. So about 14 years after uh, Andy Gould proposed this method, I was a postdoc uh, at uh, Harvard working late one night, uh, and I was analyzing data for a particular microlensing event, Ogle 2006 Bulge 109. And, uh, and we already suspected there was something unusual going on about this microlensing event. We thought it might have a planet. But then, then the final data of the night came in around midnight. I derived a model to explain this data, and that model indeed confirmed that this, planet, that this star had a Saturn mass planet orbiting it. So I sent an email to my collaborators announcing the detection of this planet, and I predicted using this model its future behavior. In particular, I said that it should be extraordinarily faint for the next 24 hours. So then I went to bed feeling very proud of myself, got some much needed sleep, and I woke up a few hours later and eagerly went into my office to look to see the data that had come in while I was asleep. And whereas I had predicted the star would be really faint, in fact, the star was nearly as bright as it was the night before, completely in contradiction to my model. So I was really depressed, questioned my ability as an astronomer. And eventually, I did actually find a model to explain the behavior of this, of this data. And it turns out that my original model was fine. It was just incomplete. In order to explain that new data, I had to invoke a second Jupiter mass planet in this system. And so it turns out these two planets bear a remarkable similarity to our own Jupiter and Saturn. And we can use this detection to come up with a very rough estimate of the frequency of solar system analogs of about 17%. Now, of course, we're going to want to refine and confirm this estimate by getting many more such detections. And I and many others are working on developing future microlensing surveys to do just that. So, which brings us now to the third question. What about the frequency of Earth-like planets? Planets with rocky, surf rocky planets with thin atmospheres located at the right distance from their parent star such that they could have liquid water on their surface and therefore potentially host life, potentially be habitable. Well, we're not quite ready to answer that question yet. Data from the H Kepler Space Telescope will give us that answer. So NASA's Kepler Space Telescope was designed to do just that, to find the frequency of habitable Earth-like planets around Sun-like stars. And already, Kepler has told us that the frequency of low-mass planets, planets with mass less than about 10 times the mass of the Earth, are extremely common and much more common than their gas giant brethren. Data already taken with the Kepler Space Telescope will eventually, in the next few years after it's fully analyzed, give us a statistical but conclusive estimate of the frequency of habitable Earth-like planets. So by the end of this decade, 
a mere 25 years after the first planet was discovered around another star, we will have very good answers to the first three of these questions. But what about this last question? What about the search for life on other planets? Well, remarkably, we're actually pretty close to being able to answer this as well. I am working with NASA and a team of astronomers to develop a roadmap for the next three decades. And firmly in our sights is the goal of a mission to find pale blue dots, Earth-like planets orbiting nearby stars at the right distance where they might be able to have liquid water on their surface. This mission would find these planets, it would take their spectra, and it would break down the constituents of their atmospheres and look for signatures of carbon dioxide, water vapor, and if we're particularly lucky, biomarkers, molecules that are indicative of the presence of life. This mission is not easy. It is incredibly hard, but it is totally conceivable. We think we know how to do it. We are limited not by cleverness, but by time and funding. And so in some time in the next 10, 20, or 30 years, we will be able to build and launch this mission capable of these searches. So what I want to leave you with is the following. All of us here today, and in fact, all of us alive today, are incredibly lucky. We are witness to a revolution. For the first time in human history, we are getting answers to our, some of our most enduring and profound questions about whether or not there is life in the universe. And with a little bit of diligence and a little bit of luck, in the not too distant future, we may be just sitting down to dinner when a news broadcast comes on telling us once and for all that we are not alone in the universe. Thank you.